Well, I think a lot of people invest where they think you need innovation. So somebody once said to me, you know, if you want to know where to innovate, look for the duct tape, look for the things that aren't working, where there's a, you know, something is just barely held together. And frankly, our mental health care system, if it is a system, is pretty broken. And so there's lots of opportunity here to innovate. Welcome to the world as you'll know it. I'm your host, Judith Warner. This season, we're focusing on the brain. Specifically, we're looking at some of the most recent and astonishing advancements in brain science, discoveries that have completely altered our understanding of how the brain works, what it's capable of, and how it can be changed. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Thomas Insel, author of the wonderful new book, Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. I first met Tom back in 2009, when he was the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. The NIMH is the world's biggest funder of mental health research. And at the time, Tom thought that he and his team were on the brink of revolutionizing the way we think about and talk about mental illness. Six years later, though, he left the NIMH for Silicon Valley. Things just weren't happening fast enough for him in the world of government research. After four startups, he's still there, still eager to innovate and still wrestling with the big questions. How do we finally make real progress in the treatment of mental illness? And above all, how can technology help? Dr. Tom Insel, welcome. Well, Judy, first, thanks for having me here. I'm delighted to have this conversation with you. I'm so glad to be here with you. You know, Tom, it's funny reading about your career in your book was like walking through a greatest hits version of American psychiatry. So in the 1970s, you did psychoanalysis. And then in the 80s, in your first job at the NIMH, you worked on antidepressants. In the 90s, you retrained as a neuroscientist. And then you came back to the NIMH, now as its director, at this incredible moment when knowledge of the brain was just exploding People were saying the 21st century was going to be the age of the brain. And like at all the other moments, there you were, front and center, right when big changes were happening. I rode this phenomenal wave through the 1980s and 90s, uh, which was, was just a revolution in the tools and in the concepts that we had for how to study the brain. It was amazing. It was just, you know, I, I was so privileged to be part of that era, uh, which I think in retrospect we'll think of as a kind of golden era for neuroscience. What made it a golden era? I mean, what were the new tools that you were able to work with? And then what were the new concepts or ideas that grew out of that time? Well, I think when I started, which was in the very early 1980s, we had a sense that the brain basically, you know, you had norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine and a few other neurotransmitters that people knew about. The whole field of neuropeptides with hundreds of new agents and then later all kinds of other molecules that were very important and other kinds of cells besides neurons that were important for brain function. All of that just transformed the way we thought about the brain, even the way we thought about mental illness. When I started, I think there was a sense that These were due to some chemical imbalance. And uh, 20 years later, there was a real sense that, well, that was a little bit simplistic and that um, what's going on here is perhaps more of of a connectional problem or a circuitry problem that we need to understand this kind of the way we think about arrhythmias in the heart. That makes me think of something that you told me when we first spoke way back when, You described to me how you'd been so inspired by what had happened with childhood leukemia, that the disease had basically gone from being a death sentence in the 1970s when I was growing up to being almost all the time curable. And you thought they were able to do that with this disease that had such a high death rate, why can't we do that with mental illness? Yeah, very much. Like, how did we do this for childhood leukemia? How did we do this for HIV? How did we make these these breakthroughs that led to such better outcomes, reductions in mortality, uh, which in the case of 
uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a 90% reduction in mortality. That's pretty astounding. And, and to me, the surprise was, and I could still remember the day I had this conversation with someone from the Cancer Institute, and I was asking her, like, how did that happen? And she said, here's the thing. There was never a breakthrough. It wasn't a new discovery. It wasn't a particular drug. There was no magic bullet. It happened because we did our homework. We made sure that we learned from every case that it was a kind of big data exercise. Every child who got this illness became essentially a research volunteer. And over time, we began to figure out how to take what we had already and use it better. And that was actually an incredibly important insight for me because like so many of my colleagues, I kept thinking, there's got to be a magic bullet out there, right? If we can just do the right set of experiments, find the right target, create the right small molecule, we're going to find the drug that will be the cure for schizophrenia or one of these other disorders. And I don't think that's a helpful perspective. I think it's important to understand that there may not be a magic bullet, but that doesn't mean you can't get much better outcomes. So you mentioned earlier that there was a sea change in thinking about mental illness with a new focus on brain circuitry rather than brain chemistry. What led to that insight and what did it mean? Well, we had we had brain imaging tools. We were able to use initially with MRI and then with functional MRI. We were able to look at first brain structure and then brain activity um, you know, not at a cellular level, but at a systems level. And there were lots of surprises. There were things that, there were, you know, brain areas that we didn't tend to think about being connected anatomically that tended to be very connected functionally. So they would activate at the same time over and over again. Who knew that those systems were even there? We began to get an understanding of the remarkable plasticity of the brain. And we could see that you know, the, the real estate in the cortex was used in different ways by different people. I mean, think about that for a second, Judy, that, that you know, that the, the way the brain is wired changes when you learn to play the violin. It changes when you learn a language. It changes when, um, when you get language. It's really uh, kind of fascinating to see, uh, so much so, there was a recent paper that was published maybe a couple of months ago that showed that you could look at brain scans and you could know whether someone was multilingual or not. And you know what you said before about plasticity makes me think about why people are scared about tech. Even if they're not using that language, talking about plasticity, they have the sense that it's changing our brains, especially kids. But you're a brain scientist who's actually gone into tech so I want to talk to you about those other things. But first, just for starters, can you talk about what it was like to make that transition? So originally, I made the jump in 2015. I went to Alphabet. It wasn't called Alphabet then. It was just called Google. And at the time, we were spinning out a healthcare company called Verily, uh, which was going to be driven by tech. So that was really my... Um, baptism in the world of, of technology. But let me tell you what I was thinking at the time. I was probably not so smart, but I was, I was getting frustrated by the fact that all this science that we've been talking about really wasn't making a difference for people in the world of healthcare, particularly mental health care. And that, um, you know, the numbers, the public health numbers for disability and death were, were getting worse, not better, even though we had so much progress on the scientific side. And, and I was thinking, well, you know, tech companies were really transforming a lot of other areas, and maybe we could do this in the mental health space. I thought, maybe we need to do a better job, not with understanding the brain, but with just understanding behavior. Because what we were basically left with were just subjective reports of how people felt, which is super important. I shouldn't say just in addition to subjective reports, wouldn't it be great to have some objective evidence? So if somebody said, I'm not sleeping well, 
maybe it would be useful to measure their sleep and find out, like, what does their sleep architecture look like? Uh, when somebody said, you know, I'm getting isolated socially, well, we actually know how to measure that. That's not that hard to do. Yeah, what's so cool now is that we're basically carrying around these measurement devices all day, right? Our phones. And there's a great example in your book of Stephen, a programmer at Google, who has bipolar disorder, and he wants to create an app that will track his moods. Can you tell us that story? Yes. So this was, uh, by the way, a made-up character. He was a composite of many people that I worked with and that I knew. But the idea was that this is a young man who had been uh, brought low by bipolar illness and then recovered. But he wanted to be able to sort of create a digital smoke alarm, you know, because he would have, like all of us, good days and bad days. But when does he need to worry And to do that, he started looking at lots of signals that were automatically collected on his phone. He could look at the email in and text in and text out to measure his social engagement, social interaction. And he used natural language processing to sort of identify the sentiment and the coherence and a whole bunch of things about about the quality of his texting and um, and his voice and all of that to try to understand, is he becoming manic? Is he becoming depressed? And he'd begin to see these patterns. So the idea here, some people call this digital phenotyping. There are lots of names for this, but it's a basically using objective signals, whether they're on a phone or on a wearable or even like your sleep monitor, to begin to get a deeper understanding Uh, or a more accurate understanding of how you think, how you feel, how you behave. So when you talk about signals, you basically mean pieces of information about how someone is doing, right? I mean, it it seems counterintuitive that the junk, you know, I wanted to say that could be collected by my phone would be valuable, more valuable even than what I might tell a doctor or a therapist. But at the same time, it makes a lot of sense because we are unreliable narrators, right? And I guess that's true, particularly if someone is in a place where their moods are actually distorting their thoughts. Yeah, exactly, Judy. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, people who have a mental illness almost by definition there is a gap between their subjective experience and other people's objective observations, right? And yet, the way that we collect information about people with mental illness is simply to ask them, how are you doing? This happens to be the place where they have the greatest problem. And we still need to know that. We still need to know their subjective reports. But it's really helpful to have additional objective data. And sometimes it's it's that gap between the subjective and objective that's the most informative. How difficult has it been, though, to interpret the data that you get in a way that's really predictive of what's going on with people? I think that's a work in progress. Part of the problem is that the ground truth that you're training to is ultimately subjective. Like, you know, when you treat somebody with severe depression um, and they start to come out of it, um, they often feel worse and not better because for months they haven't been able to feel anything at all. And so you'll pick up for them that they're improving. And uh, the, the wife knows and the kids know and the friends know and that the person who's depressed feels worse than ever. And so having a way to say, look... Here's the objective data. You know, your wife isn't making this up. You're actually sleeping better, though you don't realize it. You're actually more active, though you don't know that yet. And to be able to show that can really help somebody at a point where they may otherwise be the last one to know that they're improving. That's so fascinating. And, you know, there's been such an explosion of mental health apps since you got started with this. I feel like every single day... I'm getting something new about some kind of mental health related app on on my Instagram feed. Why has this area become such a magnet for investment? Well, I think a lot of people invest where they think you need innovation. So somebody once said to me, 
you know, if you want to know where to innovate, look for the duct tape, look for the things that aren't working, where there's a, you know, something is just barely held together. And frankly, our mental health care system, if it is a system, is pretty broken. And so there's lots of opportunity here to innovate. People ask me a lot about this question around the apps and the products and, and, you know, software and hardware and how it will change mental health and mental health care. My answer is that I think the most important thing for the mental health care system is not the products that are coming out of the tech industry. It's the culture of the tech industry. That's what the mental health care world needs. What do you mean? I mean three things that when you're in a tech company um, and you're building something, the first thing that anybody asks is, what does the UX tell you? Because in, in the world of tech, the first thing you do is you bring in the users and you have them teach you what's the pain point, what would work for them, what would they use, what would they not use. Everything is driven by users. The second important cultural piece for tech is that you're always capturing data about what you do. You're trying to figure out, is it working, is it not? And you're iterating constantly. This is something that the mental health care system has been completely unable to do, is to learn from its performance and improve performance accordingly. And the third thing that happens when you work in a tech company is you learn principles of accountability that are woefully lacking in the mental health care world. So at a company like Alphabet, you have what are called OKRs, objectives and key results, that you have to develop every quarter, but you also develop them on a year-by-year basis. And if you overshoot, you do better, you get paid more. If you undershoot, you get paid less. It's pretty extraordinary. So I feel that whole question of measuring outcomes has been such a big issue in mental health care for such a long time. You know, it's that whole as much art as science thing. So are the apps able to measure outcomes in a real way? It's a great question. I think it's too early to know. Certainly, um, there have been many companies that have solved this fundamental access problem. You know, if you can't find a therapist... I'm not going to name companies, but there are lots of them where you can go online and with the click of a button, you can be connected to a navigator or a coach within minutes. That's something, right? That's a lot better, especially if you're in a rural part of the country or if you're a minority or you don't speak English and you're looking for a therapist. Um, this, you may be kind of out of luck in a lot of places, but you can now online, you can solve that problem. I don't think think we have yet solved the quality problem. So you've said really interesting things about the quality issue. You said something in an interview recently that if we're at a time when there's such a shortage of therapists, but you can go online and you can find a whole bunch of therapists who are eager to be there because they're having trouble finding patients, then you have to wonder why they haven't filled their practices. And you wonder about the quality of the care that they're providing. Uh, the quality problem is one that I think about a lot. I think the answer is em- empirical. I think we have to start measuring outcomes. We don't do that in the brick and mortar world. Only about 19% of providers actually measure anything that looks like an outcome. Um, that would be completely unacceptable anywhere else in medicine, but in mental health, somehow that's just become the standard. I think here um, there may be ways to bake in the measurement, to do it passively and easily. There are companies that are are beginning to do that now. And then you can begin to understand and to monitor the quality question. And you can figure out, you know, A, is this person effective in what they're doing? And B, what do they need to become more effective? How can we help this person? How can we improve what they do so they get better results. And um, we absolutely can do that with the tools we have today. There is a UK company that's proven out this thesis, and they only do therapy um, remotely, but by continually measuring their outcomes and giving feedback in a dashboard to both the therapist and the patient, they've been able to improve outcomes consistently. 
So this is a moment of unprecedented hostility and um, suspicion of big tech companies. And I think people are particularly worried about the effects of Instagram and TikTok, et cetera, on kids' mental health and, and maybe on everyone's mental health. So how do you join in that conversation, speaking from your position both as a scientist and also as somebody who really believes in the potential for tech to do good? You've said that you've seen a lot of smart people who are part of the big tech companies and who are taking this really seriously and they want to do something about it. So how do you pull all the pieces together to be able to have a good answer, for example, for somebody who says just that, you know, the tech companies are evil, it's a disaster, we just have to throw out the phones? Lots of people are eager to point fingers and um, have someone to demonize, and I get that, and especially companies that are so successful, and they have been extraordinarily good at addicting young people to their products. I mean, it is phenomenal how successful they've been. Uh, The question I've been asking myself, and I don't have an answer yet, um, is can they become part of the solution instead of just part of the problem? And so I've been exploring that with some colleagues from the Harvard School of Public Health and a group called the Mental Health Coalition that's beginning to have this conversation across the major companies. I can tell you the individuals that we engage are really eager to do something helpful here. They recognize that it's not just a reputational problem, but there are real issues about what they've done in the past. Um, Whether that can be turned around or not, I'm eager to find out. I think there's certainly good intentions here, but I think we'll have to get a little bit further down the path to know exactly what that looks like. Well, I could talk to you for another hour, but I think that's a really great place for us to end. I want to thank you so much for having this conversation. It's been so great talking to you. You've really inspired me, and I I hope that people will pick up your book, Healing, because you managed to walk us through such a big landscape of science and changing ideas, changing paradigms in the book in a way that's at the same time very personal and very approachable and enjoyable as well. So thank you for that, and thank you again for being here. Thank you, Judy. Great to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Dr. Tom Insel. Join me next week as I speak with Dr. Tor Wager and Dr. Yoni Ashar about how we can use our minds to train our brains to let go of chronic pain. I think pain is, is so pervasive because it's a sign of, of many different things that can potentially be wrong. You know, so it, it occurs in almost every area of medicine and you know, many, many disorders. And so it's, you know, it, it's humbling. The more we find out about the neuroscience of pain, the more complex we see it is. So I I don't think it's right to to simplify things down to, you know, all, all chronic pain is just fear in your brain or all chronic pain is safe but just pain. But the message is that a, a lot of it actually is. The World As You'll Know It is brought to you by Aventine a nonprofit research institute creating and sharing work that explores how today's decisions could affect the future. The views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of Aventine, its employees, or affiliates. For a transcript of the episode and more resources related to what you've heard in today's episode, please visit us at aventine.org slash podcast. Danielle Mattoon is the editorial director of Aventine. The World As You'll Know It is produced in partnership with Pineapple Street Studios. Our associate producer is Yinka Rickford Angwin. Our producers are Sophia Steinert Evoy and Stephen Key. Our senior editor is Joel Lovell. This episode was mixed by Davey Sumner, and I'm your host, Judith Warner. Original music by Hannes Brown. Legal services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson Des Rochers. Our executive producers are Jan Berry. Jenna Weiss Berman and Max Linsky. The next episode will be out in a week. Make sure to listen on the Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts.